The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Hey there, folks. So there's been a lot of talk lately about poverty, justice, and economic empowerment. And I believe that the church needs to be right in the center of these discussions with a clear, loud, and most importantly, biblical voice, in particular in our inner cities. And I believe that the starting point for our discussion around poverty should be rallying around this slogan that poverty isn't permanent. Now you can tweet that if you want. You know, when Jesus says that the poor you will have with you always, he didn't intend for that to mean that poverty was some incurable disease or that we should treat the poor like they have some unfixable condition. You know, for the past 15 years, we have seen uh, poor communities like my own transform through acts of effective compassion. Literally daily, we see men and women rising out of poverty by harnessing the entrepreneurial spirit that Christ has placed on the inside of each and every individual. Now, I've had the joy during these 15 years of overseeing a group that we call Emerge, which simply stands for Evangel Ministries Economic Restoration Group. And among the many economic empowerment initiatives that we help to oversee, we believe that our top priority is helping leaders in inner city and urban context to understand the unique role that the church plays in urban economic renewal. Now, growing up poor for most of my life helps me to understand that poverty is more than just the lack of resources or positive relationships. No, if you ask anybody who's experienced any length of time in true poverty, they will explain to you that it's much deeper than that. At its essence, poverty is a feeling. And that feeling is really hard to describe. But maybe the best way for me to help you to understand this is to ask this question. Have you ever visited a desert before? By a show of hands, anybody been to a desert? I remember the first time I went through a desert, it was Death Valley. Now, for those of you who don't know Death Valley, it's also called Furnace Creek. And it holds the world's record for the highest airborne temperature in history at 134 degrees. Now, my wife and I were driving from Huntington Beach, California, to Las Vegas, Nevada. And I got to be honest, I'm not a big fan of Las Vegas. Don't believe it's a great place for Christians, but I do love my wife and love causes you to do crazy things. <laughs> and so our friends told us that driving through the desert was not going to be easy, that it was going to be a real challenge. So we did all the proper precautions. We made sure we gassed up our car. We did our best to get a tune-up. We even got a case of bottled waters to put in the back seat just in case the worst happened. But nothing, none of our preparation could prepare us for what we would encounter in the desert on that day. The heat was absolutely oppressive. It overwhelmed our AC unit. The temperature reached about 120 degrees as much as my car could register. I still remember having the AC on high, but yet we were still sweating buckets inside of our car. But the heat just didn't affect us. It affected the car as well. It seemed like the further we went into the desert, the more exhausted the car became. It seemed like the engine began to slow down and, and, and the heat was even affecting the vehicle. But far more intense than the physical conditions of being in the desert are the mental, emotional, and psychological ones. You know, I'll never forget the feeling of fear that I felt as I drove through the desert and I looked to my left and to my right, and for miles and miles, all I could see was nothing. No gas stations, no grocery stores, no water, no place for protection from the conditions of the desert. And I will never forget the haunting images of cars broken down on the side of the road because their owners didn't prepare for what life would be like in the desert on that day. And you know the only thought that kept running through my mind as we rolled through Death Valley? 
is I got to get me and my family out of here or we might just die in the desert. Now, these feelings of fear and vulnerability and being overwhelmed are exactly what the poor experience on a daily basis. They're living in a desert and they know it. And it's caused many to conclude that I have to get me and my family out of this community or we might just die here in the desert. But this presents a challenge for those of us who proclaim a gospel that tells people that you don't have to switch zip codes in order to experience the power of Christ in your life. We have the responsibility of helping people in all communities, including our inner cities, to understand that the gospel works right where they are. Now, this thought of calling poor communities deserts started in 1995 in the UK when the health department there gathered together a group of social scientists to study the the phenomenon of poverty in low-income neighborhoods. What they discovered was absolutely astonishing. They they, uh, realized that these neighborhoods lacked good quality fresh food and retail outlets. They had little to no healthcare providers and and very few viable job opportunities. This led that group of social scientists to label these under-resourced neighborhoods urban deserts. And you know, we have to ask ourselves, what type of conditions produce that type of poverty, what I would call multi-generational poverty in communities, not just third world nations, but in the most wealthy nation on the face of the planet, maybe even in human history, how do we get that type of poverty here in the U.S.? Well, there's been a lot of studies on this as well. But if I could propose, I believe that the Bible gives us two causal factors for poverty in communities. On the one hand, there is institutional injustice, and we must take this seriously. And this is typically expressed through bad public policy or poor corporate behavior. On the other hand, there is individual iniquity. And this is typically manifested through bad personal lifestyle decisions. Now, here's the question we have to ask ourselves whenever we're trying to help someone who's lived or is experiencing poverty. What is the primary causal factor for their unique situation? Now, how do you answer that? There's only one way. You have to have relationships. So I propose to you that any poverty alleviation plan or idea for economic flourishing that does not start with discipleship as its its foundation and is not built around relationship is a failed enterprise before it even starts. We have to know those who we serve. Now, if you're living in a poor community, you also recognize that there is hope. And I, and I, I got to be honest, I'm really optimistic today because over the last 20 years, there's been an awakening among churches and in the academic world, among Christian business leaders, that God has called us to roll up our sleeves and to get involved in helping to address the desert conditions in our inner cities. And that our involvement, in solving social problems is not in violation of the gospel, but actually in fulfillment of it. Good exegesis of scripture has produced a movement that's helped us as pastors and church leaders, as uh, seminarians, to teach men and women that arguably the greatest tool that God has given them to fulfill the second great commandment, to love their neighbors as themselves, is to see their occupation as more than a paycheck, but as vocation and calling. But in the midst of my optimism, I have to also be honest that there are barriers as well. There's barriers to helping the poor, and we all know these barriers, but if I can highlight the two greatest barriers that we've seen as we've helped leaders throughout inner cities uh, throughout this country. On the one hand, there is the sacred secular divide that still permeates the thinking, psychology, and ethos of our churches and our seminaries and our classrooms. You know, some would argue that the greatest gap in the church today is the gap between races. Or others would say, well, it's the gap between generations. Some would even say it's the gap between genders. 
I submit to you that the greatest divide in the church today is the gulf between work and worship, between Sunday and Monday. Sadly, our people don't see their work redemptively. And it's our job to help them to have a rich and robust theology that moves them into fruitful labor and that helps them to understand that any work that is done to the glory of God and for the good of man is world transforming. You know, the other barrier that we see is this hyper polarization and ideologies on how to help the poor. On the one hand, you have hyperliberalism that says the only way you can help the poor is through big government programs or these one-way charities. This, this type of view sees the poor paternally as only mouths that consume and not minds that create. On the other hand, you have hyperlibertarianism. That, that's hostile to any government involvement and believes that everyone should be strong enough to simply pull themselves up by their bootstraps. This view, no matter how sincere, neglects to see the real structural and institutional injustices that keep certain groups of people trapped in poverty. Now, I believe the Bible calls for a far more blended approach, that if we're going to be active in solving the complex challenges of inner city poverty, we're going to have to take a multi-sector, interdisciplinary approach to solving the problems. And so here's what we have discovered in Detroit. It's that there are three characteristics that really produce sustainable solutions for helping the poor. Let me give you these three. We use the acronym CDC. Now, the first C stands for contextualization. What this means is that we don't believe that you can just import big box ideas that worked on in another community into your community. No, your community deserves customized answers to fit their unique challenges. The D in CDC stands for data that solutions must be data-driven. We have to move from uh, sentimental humanitarianism to actually answering the tough question of, does it work? The final C stands for collaboration. This means that if we're gonna see true transformation in our inner cities, there has to be partnerships that are biblical and also practically wise between the church, the civic community, the corporate community, and social agencies. And this has worked marvelously in Detroit, my beautiful but broken hometown of Detroit. Now you may ask, how does it work? And I'm glad you asked that question. Let me just give you two examples, two examples. Detroit is arguably America's worst urban desert. You've seen in national and international headlines all of our challenges from bankruptcy to educational crises to joblessness and healthcare. We are truly an urban desert. Let me just tell you how we've addressed two of those problems. First, in the area of education. You know, in 2006, our community development team did research that revealed that of the 60,000 residents in our community, only 11% had a higher ed degree. This led to a partnership between us and Grace College in Winona Lake, Indiana. They brought a campus to our site. With it, they brought two associate degrees, one bachelor's degree. We began to recruit men and women, and we just celebrated this year our third commencement. 90%, 90% of the people that are in this wonderful program come from Detroit and many from that zip code and that's by design. I've seen and celebrated with many graduates, but maybe the lady that embodies this program the most is Colleen, a 64 year old mother and grandmother who for her entire life wanted to get her education, wanted to get a degree, but raising kids and other life challenges kept getting in the way. But when she had an opportunity to have affordable and accessible higher educational options presented to her, guess what? Surprise, surprise, she took advantage of it. Colleen graduated last year with her bachelor's degree as the valedictorian of her class. You see, for Colleen and for many others, what they discovered is that educational poverty does not have to be permanent if we use a CDC approach. Let me talk about joblessness. 
You know, Detroit's real unemployment rate has been calculated as being over 25 percent. That is four times the national average. And so we believe that the church has to be an employer. We currently employ over 25 people, and in previous years, that number has been even higher. We hire Detroiters who can help to serve the unique population that we're called to minister to. Maybe the best hire has been Aaron. Aaron's with me today. He's a lifelong Detroiter who loves the city. He brought a joy and a charisma to our staff, but he also brought a deep knowledge of the unique barriers that Detroiters face when it comes to getting employed. Employment. He rolled up his sleeves and began to partner with our local government, with civic organizations, with HR professionals from over 50 companies. Over the past several years, hundreds of people have gotten good, viable jobs with health care benefits and a livable wage, all because of his hard work. He's received commendations from local, state, and federal authorities on the work that we've done in helping to bring jobs to Detroit. And I'm so proud of the work that he's doing there. You see, for and for many Detroiters, joblessness and poverty didn't have to be permanent. Folks, the Bible gives us a rich theology of what God can do in desert conditions. I just want to leave you with one verse, Isaiah 43 and 19. God says simply, I know my plans for you. And later on, he says this, I will give you streams in the desert. Imagine what can happen in your city if you took a CDC approach and began to pull together organizations to solve the unique problems in your community, I believe that God will bring flourishing even in the desert. Thank you.